Then he spotted something in the data. And uh, I got the figures back onto the computer here. He'd bought a few cows that were Aberdeen Angus cross Hereford. And then I noticed there's something to do with the breed of the mother, which is also in the, on the spreadsheet. He compared when their calves were ready for the butcher with those from his dairy cows, and there was a big difference. The ones with the Hereford Angus mothers fattened 40 days quicker. The 40 days at 10 to 12 kilos a day is nearly half a tonne of barley, so that's roughly about 60, 70 pounds, uh, just because she had a different mother. His data showed that calves from Aberdeen Angus cross Hereford mothers were quicker at converting food into beef. It's something the ranchers back in the 30s would have known. Robert won a scholarship to travel to the Southern Hemisphere and discovered that the sons of the cattlemen who had imported the bulls back in the 30s were crossing the two breeds to produce what's called black baldies. Their black coats from the Aberdeen Angus, their white so-called bald face, that trait always passed on by the Hereford bull. This is not a new system. This is basically what the rest of the world does. Uh, and uh, I mean, I've, I've travelled and I've seen it working, and uh, it certainly works really well. The new bull is making his majestic arrival. But Robert couldn't have changed his cattle unless the pedigree breeders had improved the bulls since the days when the old films were made. He certainly wouldn't be using a black Aberdeen Angus bull if the size of the breed hadn't been restored since that low point in the 1960s by breeders like Willie McLaren. That was me when I was 16 year old. That's what I mean when I talk about belt buckle cattle. I was just a 16 year old boy at the time, really. <laughs> On his farm in Perthshire, Willie McLaren has played a leading role in increasing the size of the black cattle. In those days we were talking about belt buckle cattle, and you see where he's coming up to me now. But uh, they talked about belt buckle cattle, and, and that was down, down here. For a comparison in size, there's a picture of me holding my hand up with a bull which was double the age of this one. And my hand's away up here. And you can see how small he is because that's my hand up there. He was probably the shortest legged bull that I actually ever produced. And then this is the most extreme one of the lot. He was actually almost three year old when this was taken. So 64 was really when we hit the, the bottom of the trough. A 40 year task lay ahead. This film was taken in the 70s. It shows Willie with the small cattle. This is back in 1977, and it shows me and another breeder assessing the bulls at the bull test centre in Aberdeen. It was when everyone was leaving the breed that Willie took the biggest gamble of his working life. I decided instead of going into another breed in, 19, in the 1980s, that I would buy the best cattle I possibly could. I saw this bull in Canada. By the time I shipped him in, it cost me 30,000 pounds, which was a tremendous gamble. And it's just the same in the stock market at the present time. Those that are brave enough will take a gamble and buy the shares that are at rock bottom and they're the ones that's going to have the best rewards. Willie had made his high-risk investment. He'd have to wait for his return. The beef industry was changing. No longer were animals slaughtered behind the shop. The way meat was sold changed. High street butchers gave way to supermarkets and customers were removed one more step from the process of putting food on our plates. The butcher's van was parked up for the last time, 
and meat began to come in pre-wrapped packets. The product had to have eye appeal. It had to have the right pink colour and be lean to catch the customer's eye. Beef out of all of the red meats is probably the one that raises the most emotion in customers' minds. It's what they used to have when they went to their grandmothers or it's what their way their mother used to, to cook Sunday lunch. It's the emotion around that and it comes out in beef more than any other red meat. And the family joint is ready too. But that sentiment and the industry were about to suffer a kick in the teeth. After the debate about fat in the 70s and the early 80s worries about red meat, a time bomb exploded. About 1984, 1985, BSE hit us in a big, big way. The pictures on television of cows falling over, it was a clearly a horrible, horrible disease of cattle. BSC was a problem of the dairy industry. It was a problem of feeding uh, bits of cattle back, both to dairy cows and their young calves taken from them at birth. And in the public's mind, it was unnatural. Cows are supposed to eat grass and aren't supposed to eat bits of other cow. Government at first tried to reassure us that this was a, only a disease of cattle, could not be transmitted to humans. And then, of course, we found that it could. My wife is... Um very worried about this mad cow disease and I think that for the time being we won't buy beef for the time being. It completely blocked all exports of British beef. It could have completely crippled the beef industry. In fact it didn't. Um, it, it, there was a drop which was from about 20 percent which was sustained probably till about 1995 which is quite a significant drop but for a disease which has an incubation period of many years, really the, the real blip only lasted about six to eight months, which is, just shows how irrational people are. For the Aberdeen Angus breed, this disaster proved to be an unexpected opportunity. That one, wasn't it? 108, wasn't it? In the 1990s, David Gunner, a supermarket supplier, was part of a partnership that took up the cause of the little black cattle. The breed was largely grass-fed and so less associated in the public's mind with BSE. 